with another episode of the Joe Naz podcast. Today we're going to be talking about Tuscany and the areas around Florence. Uh, Florence is, I believe, a little bit more on the southern part of Tuscany, and it's right there in the center of Italy, as you can see. And uh, the places that I went to were north and west. And uh, the first place that I visited was right here along the coast, which is called Cinque Terre, which is basically a gathering of like five small fishing villages. And it's right there along along the coast. And those fishing villages um, are are basically gorgeous. They're right along the coast. They have along the mountains and along the mountains, they have a bunch of vineyards and stuff. And it just really was beautiful. And did you go fishing? I didn't go fishing. Um, oh. I actually went on like a group tour and that group tour left from Florence super early in the morning. And I didn't do a lot of group tours on this trip and I should have done more because I actually made a couple friends like when I would go on the group tours. Um, and you basically take this like two hour ride at like six in the morning from Florence. You wake up hella early. You're all Ex well, I was exhausted because I went out the night before, but, um, classic Joe, <laughs> classic Joe. Yeah. And so, um, and then I went to, you, you take this bus out there and I slept the whole bus ride, which was actually perfect. <laughs> and, um, we get to these, to this town and you basically take one train from one town to another. Okay. And our tour guide was a nice guy, but he stressed me the hell out. We like went to these towns and so you have like the whole day to see these towns But it's like an hour of travel between each town, right? Yeah. And not an hour of travel, but like 20 30 minutes between each town And so you spend basically most of your day in my opinion traveling From one place to the next I highly recommend if you go to Cinque Terre do not do the day tour from Florence <laughs> Go and stay in Cinque Terre for one or two nights and actually get the experience because I just felt like I was rushed and I did not plan things properly and go back but You ba I basically you see all of the towns, but you're basically being pushed from one place to the next as quickly as possible And we were just rushed through the whole entire thing and so um, I don't think I could do like that that sounds being on a bus too would just like well you take the bus to like the first place and then you're basically taking a train between each one. oh yeah. i thought you were going bus to bus to bus i was no. like dude i would have been like done yeah and so you get bro we got broken up in like the two groups and like within that group um i had a group of friends that we started talking americans that seems to be who i who i'm making friends with mm -hmm. and uh one friend who was a colombian um who was super cool and her and i ended up actually like kicking it again after after the trip um we actually, uh, Linda, shout out to Linda, and she was Colombian, and she was a lawyer, too, and so, oh wow. but she, it, you know, like, it's funny, like, I speak a little bit of Spanish, like, decently, and, you know, I spoke a little bit of Italian, but she could not speak a word of English, and it's just, <laughs> like, so interesting to me, but, you know, it's also... I probably shouldn't be assuming just because I'm American and because we speak English. That That's what all you Americans do. Yeah, right? <laughs> that we just assume that other people are going <laughs> to learn English for us. Yeah. And so we actually went out and grabbed a bite to eat after the Cinque Terre tour like the next day. And thank God for Google Translate app, man, because without it, we would have just been like sitting there awkwardly, but we would just say like you could talk to text or whatever, yeah. and then it would translate it for you. And so we were literally having a conversation through this Google Translate app, but it actually made it a hundred times more intentional because I feel like I waste a lot of words sometimes. Meaning yeah. I talk too much, but every word had to be specific because I was like, I just want this information or she would want that information. Yeah, you should use it more often. <laughs> <laughs> Just use it when you're talking to me, too. Yeah, Google Translate has saved my life in a lot of situations, especially, like, I, my Spanish is terrible. But, like, when I use it at work, like, sometimes I just don't know what to say. And I'm just like, all right, let me pull this app out. And it's just, it's awesome. Like Joe yeah. said, you talk into it. You can you can type into it. They can talk into it. And just, like, it's, like, instantaneous. It's like, boom, here's here's the interpretation. Yeah, it's, it's really great. So that was cool. So back to Cinque Terre. So Cinque Terre is this beautiful area. Um, and here's, like, a video of, like, the mountainside. So you can just kind of get an idea for what it looks like. Oh, cool. Oh, I am moving way too fast. Yeah. Um, but it's that's like interesting that it's town. all layered like that. It's like yeah, it's layered. Well, it's like they were literally hidden along the like the mountains. And so this is me launching my drone from um one of the little cities. 
Yeah. Oh, it's a body of water. You have to get naked and jump in, right? That's the rule. Okay, so you can see here, this literally the towns are like layered. And you can see the mountains and you can see like the vineyards and where they grow the grass or not the grass, the vegetables and all the fruits and stuff on the sides. And it's just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, that is so cool. I mean, like they're literally on the cliff. They're on the cliff. Yeah, they're cliffhangers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they just are along the coast. You can see the train station there, too. It just goes through these towns, through the mountains, and they're little fishing towns, and essentially it's just, like, gorgeous. And, um, yeah, I mean, as we're going through this, it's just they were telling us, like, these stories about, like, how pirates would come, and they come and raid the town, and what would happen is when they would come and raid the town, the whole village would go up into the mountains and just hide and wait for the pirates to steal what they wanted and then leave. And also part of the reason they lived in these towns was because they were so protected by the coast and they were not attacked as often. And so being in these areas was just, I mean, dude, it's absolutely, it's just beautiful. And I'm, I flew my drone over each one of them and it was super cool and really just, I got the vibe for the whole entire town and, and I really enjoyed it. And so I'm just going to show a couple of drone shots from here. And so this is the first town. Then there is the second town. Nope, that is the same town. <laughs> um, here's the second town. And let's see here. So this is the second town, which and they're all like completely different, right? But they're all just along this like coast here. And you see, has like at like half moons in the distance there, and. And basically all of the towns are just along the coast. And this one was like a little valley. And I ate here and it was like the, the seafood was some of the best seafood I've ever eaten. Obviously, if you're in a coastal city, the seafood is going to be better. Yep. But it was one of the best meals I've ever had in this little, little, tiny, tiny um, town. And it was great. That is so creepy living on the edge there. Oh, yeah, my magic, gosh. Right? You wake up and you're just like, that's all cliff. Yeah. And here's like the little valley. And from this, we actually had an opportunity to walk from one town to another to see what it was like from back in the day. And I was walking and trekking across this this um, this little journey. So you see, that's our group down there. And the machine that I'm about to show you is like, okay, so you can see like, you know, if you have fruits and vegetables, how do you get the fruits and vegetables up to the town from, you're not gonna carry them and lug them up them steps. So they had transport devices. And so, it's like, I think it's already up. So the transport device literally would be used to transport stuff up and down these railways and you would pedal it by your feet or you use it mechanically and it goes up these real railways and you collect everything and put it up there and send it up to the top. Wait, well, um, go back. Okay. So you're saying that right there. Yeah. So this device exactly would like you it basically goes on these rails. So you see like these. Rails oh, right I there. see. Yeah. So it go up these little rails right there and it would basically go up and down like the farmland and basically end up being making it to the top, which is cool. And you have to pedal up that. <laughs> you definitely could pedal it. I'm sure. I, I have no idea. how. It's, it's like one gear. Point. Like, yeah. let's go up. Yeah. But I mean, that's how you had to get things up and down. And then, yeah, like I said, on this trip, like made some friends, which was cool. All of them were Americans and. Yeah, had a good time, and it was nice to be able to talk and hang out with some people, which was rad. And this was the third town. Did Don't you know. walk to this town? I think this was the town I walked to. I'm not sure. How far was the, the walk? Was it like a couple it like miles? An, it was like an hour. This was us in the middle of the trail. So this was us in the middle of the trail. So I was walking in the middle, and like we stopped here for like some beautiful ice cream. Um, that was actually just like shaved ice and actual like legitimate lemon and lemon juice. And let's see here. Let me zoom in so you can kind of see. We were just hanging out here. So this was actually a place too where somebody got super mad at me about my droning because he was actually that's the guy right there. Which is funny because now we are zooming in on him. But he's this guy right here over to the left and he was just putting up patio furniture and he just got so angry that I was droning and, like, got up and, like, literally wanted to fight me for a bit. Oh, my and gosh. And I was, like, literally, like, apologized and just kept going on my journey. But, yeah, we walked this whole entire path. You see the village there? We walked all the way from there to where we were, and then we kept going. It's a nice trek. Yeah, and then we went to the next village, which was, uh, yes, we'll show it on the next video. But you can see, I mean, like, dude, it was just, like, picturesque, beautiful. Chingateria is beautiful. You should definitely go check it, it out. It is beautiful.
Yeah, and and the thing is, is I was seeing things that no one was seeing because of my drone. So on those cliff sides, are there like trails that go down to the water? Yeah. Okay. And this was the next town, which this is the town. Supposedly, this is the town that the movie Luca on Disney, the new one, the recent one that came out, is based off of. And so it's super, super cute town. And just like it goes down into the ocean right there. And people are just like hanging out all on this boardwalk down at the bottom. There's super famous gelato place here. There's this little fort right there to the left. And yeah, man, it was... um absolutely beautiful and i was glad that i got to go to this town too and in each one of the towns like they're all same same but different you know they have like similar flavors similar things going on and you can definitely get an airbnb in these little towns and it was and it was super cool and is it like 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 a lot of tourists or it's just the people there dude they have thousands and thousands of tourists every day the people that actually live there is less than like maybe a hundred or 200 people yeah. in each one of those little towns they make all their money from like tourist season and see like like oh, i'm aggressively moving but yeah th- most yeah. of the people do not live here year round like very small amount of people and yeah dude it was it was really cool to experience this all right we're moving on from chinca Terra. we're moving on to siena uh siena was a town is a town a medieval town that's in the middle of Tuscany and Siena is super cool in the sense that at one point it was like even considered as powerful as Florence and it could not be penetrated for the longest like like no one could dominate it mm-hmm they kept trying to take over it, but it, like, has these giant walls surrounding it, and the entire, like, city is, like, built, like, in it, it has a very high, like, elevation, and so it was very well protected, and the Medicis finally ended up conquering it at some point, but Siena has its own, like, Duomo, it has, like, all of its, like, like, here, let's just look at the first video. So for some reason, my drone, and Luca took me on a tour here, too, so my drone, like, went up, like, a bit, but it, it was like, like, check out how this is like built. The town is just like literally like layered and around it is a giant wall. And in the center there, you can see there's the Duomo over there to the top left. So they have like their own version of the Duomo, which was super cool. And just beautiful churches and different locations. And I'm going to go, I don't, there we go. Yeah, I'd go like decently high here. And, Whoa. and what this town is famous for is they have a race every single year called the Paleo. It's one of the most famous races in the planet. It's like running of the, you know, like running with the bulls in, running with in, the bulls. in Pamplona. So uh-huh. they have something called Paleo. And the Paleo is basically this, this, this race. I just need to show you a photo so you can understand. So you see this, this thousands of people in the square right here. Yeah. So the, so each, so this, the town is broken up, I think into 12 different districts. Each one of the districts has different animal that represents it. Some are like, uh, rhinos. Some are, I don't, I don't want to miss, 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 miss. I don't remember all of them now. <laughs> kind of like draw elephants, yeah. rhinos. There was rams. There's basically different animals that represent each district. I think dolphin is one of them, and you can even see like as you're walking around the different squares, like they'll have like rhinos like on their wall if it's like the rhino district, or they'll like they'll have like different they like they have like guardrails that have like this stuff. And mm-hmm. basically, this is like they're the most like intense like when it comes to like fans because like. Everybody cheers for this team. They have songs for their team. They literally, like, go around carrying banners. And when it comes to the horses, I guess there's, like, a random lottery that happens when it comes to, like, the horses at the end of when they choose the race. And so you could get a good horse or you could get a really bad horse. (laughs) And if you win, that district gets to, like, be the managing district of the whole entire area for a long time. So it's very, like, serious business in this town. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, Luca was a big fan of the Rams district, so I, I plan on going back at some my, point in my life. I'm going to go watch this race with with him. And the race is no longer than, I think, like two minutes. And people spend like an entire, like the month before is like celebrations, preparing and all this stuff, and it's done bareback. And he was telling me this, this funny story of like how one year 
the Rams were in trouble, that their rival district, they had the best racer with the best horse, and so they wanted to go shady, so they got a racer who was a criminal. And basically when the race started, he grabbed the guy and threw him off his horse, and then and then the Rams didn't even care because they were just happy that they didn't win, but they got banned from the race for the next year, <laughs> and they couldn't even participate. Oh, but, that's funny. Yeah, so it's very, very serious stuff when it comes, like, they're all, they're very much... When you, f- when you first started talking about the race and you were mentioning the rhino and the elephant, I thought they were going to be racing against each other. Oh, the animals? <laughs> oh, man, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is an intense race. There's yeah. going to be a rhino running around with an elephant and who knows what. Yeah, so but- this is, like, how the streets look like. I kind of want to just give you, like, a flavor so you can see what it's like to walk through them. Everything's uphill or downhill because you're either at the top of the hill or you're at the bottom of it, right? And then... This is just like another one. Like everything's attached. And he was telling me something interesting too because, you know, back in the day they didn't have a sewage system. So the ground, people wouldn't really walk around outside unless it was like the square and stuff because it would be covered in filth and like feces and oh stuff. And like people throwing it down there and it would all go drain downhill. So it was all pretty disgusting. Like you got to imagine that. Oh. Yeah. And then this is the Duomo. Um, this is their Duomo. As you can see, it's very similar to the one in... in in Florence and it's super cool yeah. and it was really beautiful to see that and one of the things inside so they have these marble floors that are some of the most ornate marble floors on the planet they're all kinds of different colors they tell different stories super rad and only once a year or twice a year I forget when exactly they they take off all the coverings so they can show it because when I went they only showed like 10% of it but only once or twice a year do they show all of the marble floors so everybody <clears> can see it and you can see it's just like Super ornate. Yeah. Did you see those doors at the entrance? There was someone standing next to the doors. Those doors are massive. Dude, they're huge. Every everything there is like like I like you can see the people's feet and like how big this just like the marble yeah. sculptures on the floor are and they're so detailed. And they started covering them up because you can see from people walking on them for years, they started to fade. Uh, so yeah, they'd yeah. stop letting people walk on them anymore because it was causing them to fade and to disappear. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then just like within the Duomo, there's like beautiful, like, okay, do you know what a manuscript is? Have you ever heard of a manuscript? Like, yeah, a, basically like a painted Bible. Cause back in the day they didn't, they didn't have painting presses. So this is a manuscript. You're like, look at this manuscript. The, the priests <laughs> that like, that like made these were artists. Yeah, definitely. Like they literally were artists and their stuffs are masterpieces and it's really amazing. And the amount of time they put into them was pretty wild. Um, let's see, what is this? No, I already showed you that one. So that's me in the square. So you can kind of get a reference to the size. Mm -hmm. And this is the main square where the race is done every single year. Cool. Cool. All right. One place I did go was I went to a Salvador Dali exhibit in Mm. Siena, which was super cool. Have you ever seen Salvador Dali? No. Salvador Dali is. No. You probably have seen like these types of clocks and paintings before. Uh, maybe no. okay so he's like an originator of like this type of like type of like painting and 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 this style and salvador dali like had like a very unique like perspective on art and different stuff and you can see his 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 art is like yeah it's, it's like w- out of a cartoon yeah it's totally different than everything we've been looking at so far yeah and i really like dali what is lot. what is that going on there? Is that a unicorn? Yeah, that's a unicorn piercing a heart, which I think the girl's heart is supposed to be representative of that. I don't I there was an explanation of it. I should oh, take okay. a picture. But he's very like symbolistic in his paintings and and everything has like a deeper meaning and you know this is like you know, a giant snail with like Hermes on top of it, like, or Icarus, I forget, but every one of his paintings have a very deep meaning. I really enjoyed Dolly's museum because I've always been like super frustrated with myself for not really being, um, I've always had many interests and I've never been like, this is like the one thing that I like to do or the one thing that I want to do. And I've always been like really hard at myself about it. But then when you look back in history, there are people like Dolly. Dolly was not just a sculptor. He painted. Mm -hmm. He was also a scientist. And same thing for Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was an engineer. He was, you know, a specialist on war. He did paintings. He did sculptures. Yeah. He he was, he he invented things. Like these guys were, were basically Jack, not Jack, 
best of all trades, but they were renaissance men. And I think like it's okay to have many interests and you don't have to be the best thing at one thing and don't be hard on yourself if you're interested in many things. And so going to this museum was really inspiring for me because it basically let me, it reaffirmed with me that it's okay to be inspired and to be into a, a myriad of different interests and I don't have to be locked into one thing and I think when we're growing up our parents can put a lot of pressure where it's like you should do this you should do that you should be focused on this don't look at other things but if other things interest you and inspire you look into them and explore them there's nothing wrong with that yeah I mean you should be a historian <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe this yeah is you fun. you you soak in a lot of information that just flies over in my head <laughs> yeah I don't know why, I mean, I think we can just learn a lot about who we are by looking at history and know also where to go by looking at other people's mistakes and looking at their successes by seeing a lot of the most intelligent people on the planet. They all say you can see where we are going by knowing where we've been mm -hmm. because history repeats itself and it does the same things over and over again. People keep thinking it's different. It's like, you know, if Hitler just researched you know, Alexander the Great, or, if, you know, if, if, if he basically saw that going into Russia was not the move, like a lot of these people that like try to do like world global things, right? Like, like you can see history replays itself in many different ways. And even like cyclically, like our economy, right? Like a lot of people can not perfectly predict, but they can see major cycles because we do things and do things through cycles. So I yep. think history teaches you a lot and we should pay attention to it. Leaving here, I went to a town called Barga. And I went here because, shout out to my buddy John Carlo for sending me to Barga in Italy. Barga was this tiny little town that looked like it was straight out of the Shire. It was just like in between two valleys and it was absolutely gorgeous. Um, this was the view just like from my hotel room um, in Barga. And you just like walk out and you can see just like this beautiful little valley and it's just absolutely like gorgeous. Um, let me see a drone shot. It's probably going to be better here. So this was, so this was like the hotel that I was staying at was this place right there. And then to the right, or now of course I'm going to the left. This is just me getting a shot of the hotel. One sec. Let me get a shot of, um, the valley. I apologize. Yeah. It's, uh, Italy looks very hilly. Yeah. A lot of hills mountains. and mountains, cliffs. So this is the valley that I was staying at at the hotel above. And this valley was absolutely picturesque, just like nestled in between these mountains. And it was super foggy in the mornings. And basically you just have all these little towns. And then over to the left, there's the little town of Barga. You can literally see it straight ahead right here. Mm -hmm. That's the little town of Barga. And there's no more than like, same thing, a couple hundred people that live here because most of the people that own that live there have like vacation homes and they essentially don't spend a lot of time there. And I went there because I went to a vineyard uh, that that uh, John Carlo, his family owned this vineyard. And so I went there to, literally to check out this tiny little vineyard. And, you know, there's like donkeys and horses and mm -hmm. they made their own like little flavor of of food and wine here and yeah i had a great time checking that out did you try their wine yeah i did uh what kind of wine was it it was like syrahs it was like a french wine um that's his cousin just like very picturesque valley it was like syrah um more sour the kind i don't like <laughs> just to be <laughs> honest um it was not my favorite type of wine and don't get me wrong if you like that type of wine, it was absolutely fantastic. They taught me about the process of making wine, and I, I enjoyed being there. And I met a couple people that were from the East Coast, um, which were Travis and Melissa. And I actually had a really good time hanging out with them. And we ended up going out... Um, both nights in the town of Barga and there's like there's like nobody in this town there's just like the smallest group of people and you know the most significant thing that happened to me here so I, we were talking about earlier I did drive in in it, 
pretty much actually this was the only time in my whole trip that I drove. Uh-huh. And it was when I was drove to this little town because you couldn't take a train. There was no other way to get to Barga. You had to drive there. So I rented a car and I drove and it was so beautiful driving through Italy. Like the rolling hills that you pointed out, they're just everywhere. It's so green and lush. And so I'm driving um, this rental car and... Um, piece of advice if you go to Italy definitely learn how to drive manual I didn't know how to drive manual so getting a <laughs> rental car that was automatic was extremely expensive like three times the price of getting a manual vehicle and wow I basically drove it out there and it was just it was phenomenal and Barga was beautiful and this town was beautiful and we went to this little town and we went out a couple nights we were drinking and and it was the day actually that I was leaving I was like, you know what? I want to go to the church one more time and I want to go get drone footage before I leave. And I'm driving through this town and I got lost and I basically drove up this road. I'm like, I don't know why I should not be doing this. My car barely fit in these roads. Like I'm telling you the tiniest roads, like my vehicle barely fit. Everyone sees these Fiat's and Fiat's and stuff in Italy. It's because they need them. Yeah. They can't drive normal sized vehicles in these roads. And I'm driving, I'm driving and I'm like lost. And then I'm like, dude, this is a bad idea. The moment I like think it's a bad idea. Bam. I hit the side curb and I get a flat tire. Okay. I'm not oh like, Oh my gosh, dude. I'm like in the tiniest road. First of all, a tow truck couldn't get to me if it wanted to yeah okay so here's a video of me after i get my flat tire and um it's me and my frustration at the moment um so if anyone's wondering how my day's going um i'm just gonna get my flat tire i'm gonna go Oh my gosh. Yeah. Driving in late, super fun. <laughs> <laughs> you should have had a flat tire after that, Dude, right? I literally, so I'm They sitting, didn't have like a spare? You couldn't just like pull out and just. There's no spare. Okay, so what? I'm sitting there looking in the back of this trunk. There's nothing in there. And I'm just like having a panic attack because it's not like I can call AAA. I'm supposed to be like leaving Florence the next day to go. Like I had like a flight. I, I, no, I. Yeah, I had a flight. I had yeah. to, like, go, and I, like, needed to be back. And so I'm starting to have, like, a panic attack. I'm sitting there. I'm like, <laughs> what do I do? I start calling phone numbers, and then I start knocking on people's doors. I find this old lady who speaks English. She's British. She's like, okay, try calling these people. I'm like, all right, I'll try calling these people. They don't speak a lick of English. Like, I'm calling the, t- <laughs> the tire people. They don't understand a word that I'm saying. I'm trying to use the Translate app, so I'm retyping, like, all of the word thing. I, re- I, like, type the story of what I need to say, and then I, the moment they answer, I, like, read this entire thing, and then the moment they start speaking, I'm just like, I'm fucked. They don't understand. I don't understand a word they're saying. Yeah. They don't understand a word I'm saying, and then... I start calling places and they're not answering their phones and I'm sitting there just like, oh my God, like what the heck do I do? And then the lady explains, oh, it's 12 o'clock. All businesses are closed from 12 to two. I'm like, for what? For lunch. For lunch. <laughs> and I'm just like, what do you mean? So I get a flat tire at 1155, obviously. And so I'm sitting there like freaking out and I'm like, all right. Now you got to chill. Wait, what places were you calling? Were you just calling like... Dude, I was Googling everything with the word tire or mechanic in it and just uh, asking them see. for help. And so I basically get to a point where I'm like having a panic attack. I'm like, I'm just going to go eat lunch because nothing's open and nothing's working. So I go back to the top of the hill and I get footage of the... I'm like, I'm going to get some drone footage of the church. So I basically go back. I fly my drone and just get some footage. So you can see there's a church on the top of the hill right there. Yes. And I just get like some sick footage of the town. I'm like, I got to kill two hours anyways. And then... It's beautiful. Dude, just this town this is, is gorgeous. Like, like gorgeous. Like I was in a fairy tale land, man. Yeah. Like I, I love how like the city's built on a hill. Like Yeah, for is, defensive purposes and also just for beauty. For I mean, it's... It's surrounded by all these trees. Elegant. and yeah. I just yeah, I don't see a lot of towns like that here. But um, we also don't have, I guess, like hills. Like I guess we do, but we do have hills. But like you don't see like cities or towns being built on it. It's you know, it's kind of just like homes. Yeah, and so yeah, so I go back, I get some drone footage, and then I end up running into John Paolo. Okay, <laughs> thank God for this guardian angel. This man renewed my faith in human beings because. 
I basically, I met him the day before with Travis and Melissa. We went to his restaurant called Cafe Capretz, okay? Mm -hmm. And when we're in Cafe Capretz, we were talking to Jean Barlow, and then I walk in there, and he can tell I'm, like, super frustrated. I just basically just unload on him. I'm like, I have a flat tire. My car's here. I need help. Like, blah, 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 going to, like, a million miles per hour. And he's the only person in this town that speaks goddamn English. Yeah. And I'm just like, thank God for John Barlow. He's like, Joe, you need some pasta. Yeah. Well, <laughs> dude, so he's like, he's like, he's like, it's, this was the middle of lunch hour. It's, like, rush hour, and he's, his restaurant's full. He's like, okay, I come with you. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I'm going to come help you. And I'm like, for real? And I'm like, my eye, like, I'm just so excited. Yeah. He's like, I got you. So we go back. We get back to the car. We look through all the stuff. He's like, like, yeah, he's like literally cursing in Italian. He's like, fafanculo. Like, why the hell don't these people have a, a spare tire in the car? Like uh, a jack yeah. or anything. You know what they had in the car? An air compressor for if you get a tiny hole that it just, it was useless. <laughs> so he's, he knows all the neighbors, of course, because yeah. only like, a couple, I think there's like a couple hundred people that live in this whole town. Oh, yeah. He's knocking on all the doors and he's like, hey, do you have a jack? Do you have this? This one lady had a jack. Another person, we needed a... Uh, the iron that like opens it and he's like we by the time we've gone through like four or five houses he has all the things we need to like get the tire off mm -hmm. and finally we like realize we need a part he drives me down to the to the mechanic we get a part to get to back to my tire we take off the tire and then we take it to the guy and the guy's like okay i'll, I'll change your tire for you i'm like he's like i'm like he's like do you care about the price i'm like no whatever it costs just get it done so then he's like just give me two hours so we go back to his place John Paulo then feeds me. He literally is, he's the owner of the restaurant. He's also a chef. So he cooks for us. We hang out. I hang out with him. And basically we go back to get my tire and we got the guy. Guess how much the guy wanted to charge me. And th this is like small town vibes, like times a million. Guess how much he wanted to pay, me to pay. I don't know. 10 bucks. 10 euro. That's <laughs> all he wanted me to pay for my tire being changed and like them saving my life. And I'm like, no, dude, take my money. So yeah. like, I gave him like a little bit more, but he would not take like a sufficient amount of money and just gave me basically a little bit of a used tire. And they changed it for me. Went back. This, by the way, this whole experience that I'm telling you about, yeah. this took like four or five hours. This wasn't like. Oh, yeah. yeah I'd like, imagine. He was driving me to the mechanic he was bringing me back this guy like basically took his entire day to save my ass and then what a nice after guy. everything was done we we're like i was gonna leave but i was like you know what god's telling me to hang out in barga for a little bit longer so i stay and i call travis and melissa back and i bring them there and basically like we i just was like i want to like say thank you to this guy and i just like order every food item on his menu a couple bottles of wine for like everybody else because i was like i was about to drive out of there and leave and i literally just like we got all this amazing food and he was an amazing chef and just basically hung out and laughed and joked. And yeah, it was just like, I think it was God telling me to slow down again Yeah, and just to relax. Cause I was like in a rush <laughs> trying to see like one other place on the way out. Yeah. You thought you were having a bad day, but it turned out to be an awesome day. Dude, it turned out to be great. I'm friends with John Paulo till for life. I wrote him yeah. uh, like the most amazing review I've ever written for anybody online. I write a lot of reviews and it's like, I keep getting notifications from Google that it's been seen like over 25,000 times. Oh so my I gosh. hoped it helped his business. I actually gave him a lot of business advice and I think he's used it because he's like asked me questions about it. So it's like God had a plan for me to chill and to hang out in Barga a little bit more. But dude, it really just like, and I tried giving him cash money at the end of the day and he said something to me. He's like, he's like, no, I can't take this money. If I do, it would take away from me. Like I wanted to do this. I wanted to help you. And mm. basically what he was trying to tell me is like, now you pay it forward. Yeah. Someone needs help. You help them. And it was like, it was just like really literally renewed my sense and like faith in humanity. Cause I was like, dude, I was like, I was like literally sitting there shaking on the side of the road. I'm like, what do I even do right now? How do I get a tow truck? Like what yeah. the hell am I supposed to solve this problem? This guy took his entire day to help me. Wow. What an amazing human being. Shout out to Giancarlo there. Shout out to Giancarlo. If you're ever, Giancarlo, if you're Giancarlo, ever, if sorry. you're, Giancarlo is my friend. Oh, okay. Friend, you've met Giancarlo before, yes, I think. Yes. But if you're ever in Barga, in this little town, and you don't go to Cafe Capretz and give that man a hug, shame on you. Go there. <laughs> good food. It has a view of the mountains. He's the nicest man and Capretz. C A. P P R E T Z and it was fantastic. Yeah, and if you get a flat tire there, go there too. <laughs> Dude, just honestly, like, man, I was not, I was not keen on Italians before this gentleman. Like, I don't know what it was. Just like. I just wasn't meeting that many people, and dude, he he's just a good man. So shout out to him. All right, and that was the biggest thing from Barga, um, and yeah, I mean, one sec, I want to see, I want to show you this tree. I know it sounds weird. 
But yes, okay. So you ever like, not? I'm not a tree hugger in any way, shape, or form, but obviously I believe that ant plants are alive because they are. Yes. You ever like see a tree and you're just like, that tree has seen some things. That tree's been around. And this tree was just the only major tree next to this church. Look at this tree. This tree is bigger than the church. Mm -hmm. um, if I can get a good, I'm not going to be a crazy. Okay, one sec. Am I going to go up? Oh, the next video is probably what I want. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So this is this tree. Dude, and I sat there and I just like sat on this tree for like, for like a half hour just like thinking on it. And I just remember feeling like this emotion, like as I'm like feeling the tree. And I started making a point like during my trip, whenever I would see a tree like this, just like going up and like putting my arm on it. And like I noticed like different trees would give me different feelings. And it's just like this thing's alive. It's for sure seen, you know, waves of people come in here, you know, like seen wars or seen battles and just seen different stuff. And literally like it, it felt like an emotion and it's just like it's like you just you just see this tree and you knew it was special and you can see it's bigger this and it's bigger than the church itself. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing about trees, man. I mean, like I said earlier, like I this love seeing is, massive yeah, trees. Oh, sorry, that's what I wanted to show you. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was saying, like I was saying earlier, I love seeing massive trees, like big, thick trunks, you know, because they they've been there literally for hundreds of years, you know? Yeah. Yeah, this is the grandfather tree of this town. Like, it is bigger than the entire church. And this is the biggest church in the whole area. Wow. And it's just huge. And, yeah, and I just had an opportunity to hang out with it, which was cool. Yeah. So that's uh. I I would have tried to climb that tree. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I actually thought about it. I couldn't reach the first branches. Cause yeah. I, well, I well when, I was, when I was younger, you know, I loved climbing trees. We had a big tree in our front yard, and I would just climb up there. And I... I tried to build a, a, a tree house, but it, it didn't work out because I didn't know what I was doing. But um, we would just hang out up there and like you can see everything. It was just nice. Yeah. OK, um, so moving on from Barga. So we're going to Barga and now we're going to. Um, yeah, let's go to. No, we didn't go to Milan next. I think that's going to be pretty much the end of Tuscany for me. So let's go ahead and end it here mm -hmm. on the good note of the Italians giving me a little renewed faith through Gian Paolo. And thank Gian you, Paolo. Gian Carlo. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because Gian Paolo, when we were hanging out, after all of the helping with the tires, I called Gian Carlo and I told him about Gian Paolo. And he tells me, dude, he used to work with my sister in a restaurant when we grew up. Get out of here. John Paolo since I was a kid. And so like my friend ended up knowing this guy and then we started talking about him. And it's just like it was just like literally this guy that's friends with my friend just ended up saving me halfway across the world when I was a lost child. And it was yeah, it just it was cool. That's awesome. Man. It was awesome. Yeah. So on that note, we're out of Tuscany. Oh, before we leave, remember I told you I learned about Amarone? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I learned about Amarone from Travis that I showed you the picture of and his wife, Melissa. And I learned oh. about it on this trip. And that's where I learned that was my favorite wine. And yeah, so that's where there I learned you go. from these guys. So shout out to Travis and Melissa. I appreciate you guys. And Is that where you had it with them? Or you just... That's where I had it for oh. the first time, yeah. And, and we ended up, like, talking, um, you know, I, as I've been going through my journey, I've realized a lot of people obviously open up about traumas that they've suffered and things that they've gone through. And I spent a lot of time with Travis and Melissa on this trip. Um, and it's funny, they saw me sitting by myself at the vineyard because people are, were weird about COVID in Italy still, right? Not mm -hmm. weird, that's the wrong word to use, but they were still cautious about COVID. So even they kept people in groups at the vineyard so they're not the risk of giving each other, you know, COVID. And then Travis and Melissa saw me sitting by myself when we were at Giancarlo's family's vineyard. Mm -hmm. And they're like, dude, come sit with us over here. And so I sat with them, we became friends and honestly it was really nice to have some friends like there was just little spurts of friendship on my journey mm -hmm. and they kept me going and i think if it wasn't for like moments like that with them i might have gone home yeah yeah i just like felt super lonely a lot of the time like that was a, the continuing theme with my mentality i was just super lonely and i really i mean you know how social i am imagine months on end not really 
talking to people, hanging out with people, like other than when I called home, but I was like ashamed to call home because mm-hmm. I didn't want to call home and tell my friends I'm depressed and I'm lonely and I'm in Italy eating pizza and pasta and this is not exactly the experience I was signing up for. Yeah. 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 That must have been very traumatic for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude, I'm, on the other side of it now, it's funny because I definitely am more comfortable with being alone than I've ever been in my life. Yeah. And what I can say is when you're comfortable being alone, you're comfortable being with yourself and there is some level of peace and not even like happiness, but just a level of peace that comes with that. And it takes you putting in the work to get to that level. And I highly recommend that everybody on the planet, if you're not comfortable with being with yourself, you haven't taken the time to process thoughts. You haven't taken the time to meditate, whatever it is, but you need to, because when you reach that level of being comfortable with yourself, you just kind of gain a new level of relaxation in your life. You're not always anxious. You're not always feeling like you should be doing things. You're not always feeling like pressure. It just, things become more comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Have you reached that point in your life? Uh, Yeah. I mean, I've lived alone for a while. Um, And it was weird at first because, you know, I've always lived with my family. And uh, when I moved out, I had a roommate. And then, you know, I, I ended up moving back to L.A. from, like, the, the Inland Empire. And I lived by myself for a while. It was weird at first because, you know, like, I would hear things and think someone was, like, there. And I'm like, oh, wait, wait a second. I live by myself. Um, but I, I think, for me, I've always been kind of a loner. Not a loner, but, like, a lone wolf. Like, I, I didn't mind being off on my own. Um and uh, I was very comfortable with it. So it was just weird not being around people, but I was still comfortable being there by myself, uh, if you get what I mean. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so, and it's, it is weird, like, your first, like, month or a couple weeks because there's not that constant human interaction. And, you know, social media wasn't a thing yet. Like, uh, having cell phones, like iPhones wasn't a thing yet. So I felt like I, there was still a disconnect there. Um, and then as, you know, as I went on, like I ended up, you know, moving in with a roommate and everything like that, but I'm very comfortable with being by myself. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Did you notice that when you were not around others that you stopped worrying about what other people wanted and what their needs were and, and that you were paying attention to what your needs were for the first time? Um, not exactly because I've always been like that. I've never, it's, it's one thing that I don't know if it's good or bad, but like, I've never ever cared about what people thought about me or, uh, or people around me. It's just like, I always wanted to be myself, yeah. you know? Um, even like growing up, you know, I had three siblings and, um, if, if my family liked something, I was like, I'm opposite. I like opposite of that, whatever it was. I don't know why I always did that. It was just weird. No, I mean, dude, I, I respect that about you. And that was, I guess that's just like my insecurities is like, even like being in this room right now, like if I saw one of you needed something, my insecurities are like, I need to make sure that they're okay before I worry about myself, like trying to like help out. And so like, I know, yeah. That's super nice of you. Like sometimes like I had to get into a mood to like, not a mood, but like I had to train myself to be cautious about people around me because like I was just no, I was just like very nonchalant about things. And, um, and you know me, like I'm a jokester, like I laugh about everything and I kind of had to watch what I said around people. People might take it the wrong way, but like as, as far as like people looking from the outside in at me, like I could care less, like you can talk smack, you can do whatever you want. Um, like I, I'm just a free spirit. Like it doesn't bother me, you know, but one thing I will tell you I learned is, uh, I learned not to be around negative energy. Like it's, it drags you. Like sometimes I just, I just dealt with it, whether it be from family or friends. And, uh, it really does like pull you down. And, um, that first month I was like by myself, I did get a little depressed, you know, like there was just certain moments where I was just like, oh, I wish someone was here having dinner with me yeah. or like, you know, or just someone there, you know, to talk to. Um, and uh, uh, it was weird, too, because like Netflix wasn't a thing. So I I don't even think I had a TV in my in my place. 
And I was just like, cool with it. I was like, oh, I don't need a TV. Uh, I didn't want to pay it for a cable bill. I, honestly, that's what it was. But then like, it was just not nice not having that kind of distraction. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was weird at first, but I, I mean, you get used to it. But I, like I said, I've always been kind of a lone wolf and, yeah. you know, I can go out and meet people or, you know, or s stay home. It's not a problem with me, you yeah. know? Yeah. Cool. All right. On that note, I think we should close out Tuscany and we're going to go to Northern Italy next. So ciao, ciao.